Hello everyone, my name is Shruti and today as a representative of Psi Alpha, I will be narrating unit three of our psychology curriculum, which has to do with vision and hearing. Listening to music and waking up to birds, these are all things you get to enjoy because of how the human ears function. Our ears are very complex organs that allow us to hear all of the beautiful things that life has to offer. And you might take it for granted because there are many things about the ear that you probably don't know. This is um, a structure of our ears. In abstract, ears are easily identifiable and associated with listening. However, when you focus and dissect the individual parts of the ear, you'll realize that the ear is a complex organ and there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. So reflecting back to our diagram, the ear is primarily divided into three main parts, the outer, middle, and inner ear. The outer ear is often called the pinna, and it's the first part of the ear that sound waves reach. It's a visible portion of the ear that collects and directs sound waves throughout our ears. The middle ear is essentially a chamber between the eardrum and the cochlea, containing three tiny bones that concentrate the vibrations of the eardrum on the cochlea's oval window. The middle ear contains the smallest bones in your entire body, with the stapes being the tiniest. And these three bones help transmit sounds to the inner ear, but altogether, they're so small they can fit on a penny. And the innermost part of the ear contains some of the most delicate parts, including the cochlea, semicircular canals, and the vestibular sacs. Next, let's discuss specific parts of the ear. In these next few slides, I'm going to be explaining the location and the function of these three highlighted parts, the auditory, eardrum, and cochlea. The auditory part of the ear is essentially a canal that functions as an entryway for sound waves, which gets propelled towards the eardrum. The eardrum is a tight membrane in the middle ear where when sound waves hit it, it vibrates. These vibrations move the tiny bones of the middle ear, which we discussed before, and those bones send vibrations to the inner ear. From the inner ear, the message is sent to the brain, which is why when the eardrum is not intact or it's broken, there's usually some hearing loss involved. And the cochlea is a coiled, bony, fluid-filled tube in the inner ear. Sound waves traveling through the cochlear fluid trigger nerve impulses. And a fun fact about this is that even though this snail shell looking thing is the size of a pea, if you unraveled it, it would be a tube about 31.5 millimeters long. Now, in science, variables are often used to detail and abbreviate certain terms, like how A stands for acceleration or V for velocity. Likewise, when measuring sound, we use the measurement of decibels, abbreviated as dB, named in honor of Alexander Graham Bell, who was the inventor of the telephone and the audiometer. In the information provided in the graph, you can see that humans have a hearing threshold of about zero decimals, I mean, sorry, decibels. Above this threshold, Sounds with higher sound pressure levels are heard as louder noises, which is why something at 20 decibels is going to be quieter than something at 40 decibels. Sounds above 90 decibels, at this line right here, can lead to chronic hearing damage if people are exposed to them every day or frequently. Now, you may be wondering what the threshold of hearing is. It's often described to as the absolute threshold, which was studied by German scientist and philosopher Gustav Fechner. Specifically, the absolute threshold is the minimum stimulation necessary to detect a particular light, sound, pressure, taste, or odor 50% of the time. Furthermore, to function effectively, we need absolute thresholds low enough to help to allow us to detect important sights, sounds, textures, tastes, and smells. We also need to detect small differences among those stimuli. The difference threshold is the minimum stimulus difference a person can detect half of the time. Essentially, in the pictures of the two Coke cans you can see here, 
you can somewhat find some comparisons and contrast between the two images. That is the difference threshold, the ability to detect changes or differences between the two stimuli. For more information, we've added a YouTube video on the absolute and difference thresholds by Mr. Brad Ray. We can't view this video during this presentation, but we have attached a link to it in the description, so you should check it out. Now, by far the most important and unique organs of sense in humans are our eyes. We perceive 80% of all stimulation by means of our sight. And if other senses such as taste or smell stopped working, it would be the eyes that best protect us from danger. Furthermore, it's also the fastest muscle in your body, hence the phrase, in the blink of an eye. In this slide and the next, I'll be expanding, oh. Okay. In this slide and the next, I'll be explaining and expanding on all the different parts of the eyes. Let's begin with the iris. The iris is a colored muscle that dilates or constricts in response to light intensity. It forms a colored portion of your eye around the pupil and controls the size of the pupil opening. What is the pupil though? The pupil is the adjustable opening in the center of your eye through which the light enters. To ensure that no bacteria or dirty microscopic things go inside your eye, the cornea is the eye's clear protective outer layer that covers the pupil and iris. Furthermore, the lens is the transparent structure behind the pupil right here that changes shape to help focus the image on the retina. The retina is the light sensitive inner surface of the eye containing receptor rods, cones, and layers of neurons that begin the processing of visual information. The fovea is the central focal point in the retina around which the eye's cones cluster. The blind spot is the point which the optic nerve leaves the eye creating a blind spot as no receptor cells are located there. And lastly is the optic nerve, which is a nerve that carries neural impulses from the eye to the brain. Light travels in waves and the shape of those waves influences what we see. Light wavelength is the distance from one wave peak to the next. And that wavelength determines hue or the color experience. A light wave's amplitude or height determines its intensity or the amount of energy that the wave contains. The more intense a light is, the brighter it is. Now look at this splatter of color. You see all the color that we see there? But have you ever wondered how we see color? There are two different theories, the young Helmholtz trichromatic theory and the opponent process theory that attempt to explain how we perceive color. The young Helmholtz trichromatic theory explains that the retina contains three different types of color receptors, one most sensitive to red, one to green, and one to blue. When stimulated in combination, they can produce the perception of any color. For example, the retina has no separate color receptors sensitive to yellow, but when the green and the red wavelengths stimulate both the red sensitive and green sensitive cones, we see yellow. Opponent process theory explains that opposing retinal processes, such as you know, red, green, blue, yellow, or white, black processes, enable color vision. For example, some cells are stimulated by green and inhibited by red. Others are stimulated by red and inhibited by green. In other words, the trichromatic theory explains how color vision happens at the receptors, while the opponent process theory interprets how color vision occurs at a neural level. Imagine that you're in class. How can we judge if a person is 10 or 100 meters away? Retinal disparity won't really help us here because there won't be much of a difference between the images cast on our right and left retinas. At such distance, we have to depend on monocular cues, depth cues such as interposition and linear perspective available to either eye alone. There are many monocular cues, but for this presentation, we'll only be discussing five of them. The first one we'll discuss is relative size. If we assume that two objects are similar in size, 
most people perceive the one that casts the smaller retinal image as farther away. In this situation, since we would assume that the pool balls are equal in size, and because we can see that the eight ball is casting a larger image, we can perceive the eight ball as closer to us than the orange one. The next is interposition. If one object partially blocks our view of another, we perceive it as closer. Look at this picture. Since the first wooden horse is partially blocking our view of the other horses, we see the first horse as closer to us. In regards to relative clarity, light from distant objects passes through more atmosphere and therefore they are perceived as hazy and farther away than sharp, clear objects. Since the picture contains a blurry and hazy background, the chain fence appears to be clearer and sharper. Look at this picture now with the road and the two trees. Don't you feel as if the tree on the top is a bit farther away in comparison to the bottom tree? Relative height explains that we perceive objects higher in our field of vision as farther away. And the last concept is relative motion. The best example to demonstrate relative motion is on a train. As we move, objects that are actually stable appear to move as well. And as we ride the train, a moving object, the outside objects being stationary, appear to move. So that's all for the end of this presentation. Thank you for listening to our unit three narration of vision and hearing. Have a good day, everyone.